Chapter 18, Never Trust a Cripple. I'm waiting for something to happen. The whole world except me is asleep, and the only sound is him breathing heavy. I'm trying to see through the curtains, out the old lady's window when it finally gets light. But the snow is stuck to the glass, and everything is fuzzy, which is pretty much how I feel. Looking down at him on the floor, how he overflows the rug, I think about that story where a giant falls asleep and is tied up by little people. Not that I do anything. I'm just a blob in the chair with numb hands and numb feet. Finally, what happens? There's a noise from the back in these light, skittery footsteps, and then my father comes awake so fast, he almost yanks me from the chair. He's on his feet, with this wild look in his eye, and Loretta Lee glides into the room. Merry Christmas, boys, she says. She's got this pizza box in her hands, holding it out like a present. Where's Iggy? My father asks. Waiting for Santa Claus, Loretta says. Ain't nothing open this morning, but we got this left over. You're welcome to it. Best put that down, he says. And he pulls on the rope and lifts me up. He gives her this cold look. You go on and get Iggy, he says. Loretta Lee is wearing this long winter coat. It looks clean and brand new, so she probably got it for Christmas, but her legs are skinny and bare where her feet go into these old rubber boots. She's smoking this cigarette and squinting through the smoke at my father, like she's trying to figure out what he's thinking. Why can't you be nice, Kenny, she says. We had some good times in the old days, remember? The old days are over, he says. That the best you can do for us? Leftover pizza? Hey, pizza's good for you, she says. It has vitamins and stuff. I still want to see Iggy. Loretta takes a drag on her cigarette, and she's got this crooked smile. Her eyes keep flicking at me and the way I'm roped up, but mostly she's looking at him. It'll be up soon, she says. He had himself a tough night. I have business with him, Loretta, he says. Important business. I'm sure, she says, and she turns in her boots and leaves through the back. The pizza box is sitting there on the table but my father says we can't eat anything touched by her dirty hands. So he walks me out into the dark little kitchen and he unties me and we go through the cupboards and find mostly boxes of prunes and old cereal. There's nothing in the refrigerator that hasn't already gone bad. So I eat a bowl of cornflakes with water and I'm so hungry, it almost tastes good. This is what they call a temporary situation, he says. I know a way we can live like kings if we play our cards right. He stops for a while and squints at me, like he wants to see inside my head. We'll be heading for warmer weather. That agreeable with you, boy? Yes, sir, it is. He seems real thoughtful. I had a lot of time to plan this out. A lot of time to study people, figure what makes them tick. First thing, we'll get a bus one of those RV things, a real big one, because it's important to look impressive. Put a name up on the side, the Reverend Kenneth David Kane. Or it might be, we'll go with another name, just to be on the safe side. Did you guess I was a man of God, boy? Could you tell by looking at me? Yes, sir, I say. I mean, no, sir. What's that mean, boy? I don't know, sir. He reaches out and tussles at my hair. You'll learn, he says. You'll be standing out in front of the bus in a real nice suit. What you do is collect money in a basket. You won't have to steal it, because folks will give it to a man of God. And what they love to hear about is a bad man who's redeemed himself. I learned how to preach the word to a lot of illiterate convicts, but they were no more ignorant than a lot of other folk. No, sir. We're going to do just fine. After I finish the cornflakes, he ties me up again. It's just a precaution, he says. 
Can't take any chances until you see the light. You want to see the light? Yes, sir, I do. He's grinning at me and he taps himself on the chest and says, You're looking at it, boy. I am the light. Don't you ever forget it. He turns on the TV. It hardly comes in at all. The screen is so fuzzy. And he keeps switching channels. And he's cussing out the old lady for having such a crummy TV. All that's on is Christmas stuff and cartoons. And what he wants is the news to see if we're on it. I bet they haven't even missed you, he says. Kept you down in that cellar like an animal. How would they know? We're sitting there, waiting for Iggy, when the blue lights start flashing bright against the curtains. He quick grabs me by the neck and shoves me down to the floor, and we both lie there. The blue lights go by real slow. You can see them shining all around the room. Might be someone else they're looking for, he says. Place like this, it could be anybody. Still, you can't be too careful. When the lights stop flashing, he crawls to the window and looks out. It's nothing dumber than a dumb cop, he says. If they were so smart, they wouldn't be working on Christmas Day, would they? No, sir, I say. You hush up, boy, and let me think. I'm laying there on the floor, tied up, when Iggy sneaks in through the back. I know it's him by the draggy way he walks and the heavy boots. Kenny, he's whispering. You there? Of course I'm here he says. Show yourself. Iggy comes into the room and his eyes are darting around. At first, he's surprised to see me trussed up. Then he shrugs and doesn't look at me anymore. Close call, he says. You see that cop car? I saw it. They come right up to my door looking for the boy, he says. I said, come back with a search warrant. You want to see what I keep under my bed? but I let him have a good look from the door, satisfy him you weren't there. They believe you? Who knows with cops? Then my father is sort of dropping his arm around Iggy and giving him a squeeze. And you can see the cold, scared look in Iggy's eyes and that wet mouth of his inside his beard. You turn on me, did you? My father says. That how they just happened to come to your place of all the places in this town? Iggy laughs real nervous. It was that crippled midget kid, he says. They had him out in the car. It must have been him. Loretta saw him peeking up over the, sp the seat. Freak. What midget kid? My father asks. Think I'll fall for that? Iggy points at me and says... Ask him, does he have a midget friend? The two of them stole Loretta's purse. That's how come they know this place. That's a God's honest truth, Kenny. My father kneels down and looks at me up close. His face doesn't show anything. Well, he says, what's your story? We didn't steal anything, I say. We just brought it back. Oh, my father says. Now that's an interesting story. I like that story. Iggy is talking fast like he can't wait to get rid of the words and leave. Crippled up kid belongs to Gwen. Remember Gwen? He and your wife were pals. That's what Loretta says. My father puts his hand on Iggy and shoves him down into the old lady's chair. Never mind about her. Doesn't matter how the cops got on to you. All that matters is they did. And now, what do we do about it? Iggy's scratching at his beard, and he starts to say something. And my father says, shut up and let me think. Iggy shuts up. Every now and then he sneaks a look at me, like he's trying to tell me something with his eyes. But I can't figure out what. After a while, my father says, first thing, get me a firearm. Something small but functional. Next thing is transportation. I don't care what, as long as it runs. Can you do that for me? Iggy says he can, no problem. Then do it, my father says. Quicker the better. Iggy leaves, walking backward out of the room. My father lifts me up by the rope and says, 
I know you have more sense than to waste your time stealing pocketbooks with a cripple, kid. You can't trust a cripple, but I guess you know that now, don't you? He shakes the rope. Yes, sir, I do.